Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Harry Matsuoka, and we're here at the Moon Hills Nursery in Santa Ana. And class today is on growing roses or rose garden culture. So the nice thing about roses is that, at least in Orange County here in California, they can bloom every day of the year. That's the one thing that a lot of plants can't do is these can bloom all the way around the year because they don't get a killing frost most years. I mean, we've had a few years back in the 80s and 90s where the cold winter would actually put them to sleep. Very unusual. Uh, it hasn't happened for what, 30, 30 years at least now. Uh, but they can bloom year round. Now, unfortunately, we have a few more disease and pest issues than we did in the past, but still, uh, the disease and pests normally don't kill the roses. There are a few exceptions, but generally, uh, if you don't treat your roses, they'll be fine the next year. So, now, the soil wise, roses are quite tolerant, one of the most tolerant plants on whatever type of soil you want to put in them. So sandy soils, now, now if you're a forest grower and you want to grow the tallest, longest stems, biggest flowers, you put them in pure sand. So most forest roads are growing sand or something real loose like that. It makes them grow really tall, uh, but they tolerate clay just fine. It kind of slows them down a little bit, but they're fine with that. Now, the other thing about roses is they also tolerate improper growing conditions. So we uh, recommend that they grow in a very sandy, unamended soil. If you amend it, put sand in or some one of our products like our top pot, you know, containers, we grow them in our top pot. Um, we also use our acid mix, which is pumice and peat moss. Add the soil men or put you can grow those and you can use this in pots also. Uh, we do not recommend putting compost in the ground around them. Now, compost on the top of the ground is perfect. Compost in the ground kind of messes up their roots. And the same with any plant, but roses are actually more tolerant of that. It's, they still don't like it. So mm. And generally, you can buy a rose from just about any company, even if they put them in the wrong soil to begin with, and they'll do fine. Although, if you get them from us, uh, you'll get some amazing plants that do really well. So, I mean, we, we challenge you to find roses with leaves as big as ours. Uh, large leaves is a sign of root health in general. So, big leaves, good, good roots, um, everything's good. Now, spacing wise, or where you want to put them, Typically, the best spot in a yard is morning sun, afternoon, you know, I say late afternoon shade. But most of the rose flowers don't like extreme heat. Uh, the plants are fine in heat, but the flowers sometimes don't like it. Now, it doesn't, you don't have to be perfect about that. If you only want one or two roses and you have the, not the right spot to put them in, they usually do okay. I mean, the first house I bought back in the 80s, there were roses between houses on the north side, a place where you never think about putting roses. And it, there were two roses there, and they're fine. They performed well. There was, you know, about a maybe 15-foot gap between the houses, but still, it's a spot that you would not normally recommend it. Was, there was no good air circulation in there. Uh, I didn't get any morning sun. Got midday sun, then lost the sun a few hours later. So it wasn't the best spot, but you know they were fine. So now you can the general rule for spacing them if you have them together in a bed is about three feet center to center. So the center of one plant either center of the next is three feet. That's the uh, that's what's usually recommended. The further you go, the bigger the plant will grow. Uh, although they most rows don't get much more than about four, four, four and a half foot wide. Uh, but the fewer disease and bugs you'll see. In fact, if you only have one rose uh, in the middle of the yard, it may never get diseases or bugs. 
if it's isolating, that if you have a bunch of rows real close together, uh, you know, 20 or 30 in a spot, if they get mildew, sometimes they all get mildew disease. If they get spider mites, sometimes they all get spider mites because it just travels from plant to plant. Of course, if you're all together, it's easier to treat them for that. So there's, you know, advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, so spacing wise, three feet apart. Uh, generally, you don't want to go more than two rows deep. Uh, just because you've got to prune, you know, there is some pruning you have to do. And if it's three rows deep, it's just harder to get to them. So two rows is good. Um, I would often have the tall rows in the back and the shorter rows in the front. If, if it's, say, a front yard, if it's a back yard, it's, it's whatever you want to do. Yeah. Now, there are different classes of roses. Uh, the one we center on most is called the hybrid tea, which is one big flower per stem. Now, they're not limited to that. They can do more than one flower on a stem, but that's where they look the best. And those, the hybrid tea roses are generally the ones you cut and put in the vase. The real big, nice, single flower. And generally, they grow taller than the other roses. The other big classification would be Floribundus. They got the hybrid teas. <laughs> and uh, they were developed back in the 1870s, I believe, the first hybrid teas. So there is this. Rose, I think they're all from Asia, called a hybrid perpetual. And then there are the tea roses, and then they crossed them and they got the hybrid tea. Um, and they bloom, they can bloom year round and they bloom on new growth, which is important. And then from that, they cross the hybrid tea with something that's called a polyantha rose. This would be a kind of a typical style of polyantha rose, a small flower. So they cross the hybrid teas with these and got what are called floribundas, which are generally shorter than the hybrid teas, not always, but generally shorter. And they have flowers and clusters. Now, there's not much difference between the floribunda and the hybrid tea. Sometimes they're breeding floribundas and they get a hybrid tea. Sometimes they're breeding hybrid teas and they get a floribunda because the genetics are so mixed up nowadays. Um, basically, and there's another class too between these called Grandiflora, which are bigger flowers uh, in clusters. And the main way reason for calling them different things is that because the hybrid teas can make clusters of flowers also. Uh, I think I kind of brought one in here that was doing that. I guess I forgot. Okay. So on this particular plant here, this is a typical hybrid tea. You can see this stem here. It's got one flower at the top, but it's got three, four little flowers, five little flowers growing, but right below it. So it's acting like a grandiflora or floribunda, but this generally this rose looks best with just one flower. There's no rules on this. You can have four or five flowers on the end of a hybrid tea. The weight might be a little heavy, might bend over a little bit. Sometimes the flower doesn't have as many petals. If you let all these side buds develop, you'll get, remember the rose called Honor back in the 1980s, uh, came out in 1980. It was a big white rose, but it wanted to have a cluster of 20 flowers. If you let that cluster of 20 flowers form, each flower had six petals. It wasn't the classic. It's supposed to have like, I think, 25 petals on it. And the only way to do that was to cut out all the little side buds. There was a lot of work to make that flower look good. Whereas hybrid tea should just have one big flower at the end. But if they're, you know, if the plant's really strong, it will make a cluster. And it's up to you whether or not you want to keep that cluster or not. No rules there, unless you take it to a rose show and you have a cluster in your rose show, they'll they'll scratch that off the the winner's table. They won't let you win with the cluster of roses on a, what's supposed to be a hybrid tea. 
Now, for Abunda, is you can cut out the side buds and make this one flower, but what happens then is this single flower has got too many petals. It won't have the classic form. It'll just, you know, it may not even open. It has so many petals on it. So on the floor abundance, they look better in the ground of forest if you allow them to have a cluster. If you take, if you thin them out to one flower, then your flower may have, may not look like too many petals on it. So that's the different roses. Generally, for front yard displays, we like, we recommend the floor abundance because the hybrid teas generally, on average, will grow about five feet and they'll hide your house. Whereas uh, Floribundas, <laughs> on general, will go about, grow about three foot. So average height, five foot, average height, three foot. So these look better in the front yard. And they'll give you a lot more flowers in each bloom also. Um, so soil is not, as important as it should as it could be again if you have a sander soil you'll have taller roses i mean i did that once in my yard and my front yard and i said okay that wasn't the right thing to do so i had a rose bed up so one of the things to worry about roses too is there is quote a ro replant syndrome so if you grow a rose for say three or four years it dies or you just get tired you know you get bored with it you pull it out put another rose right there that second time you grow a rose it doesn't grow in that same spot uh, because you left the dead roots behind so if you pull a rose out even if it wasn't dead when you pulled it out now the ground is filled with all these tiny rotting rose roots put another rose in there it just sits there and does nothing for quite a while five years or more it does nothing so we, I encountered that back in the 80s. I mean, I had a 50 rose rose garden. I was, I got bored easy. So the first batch of roses I put in there, a great display, all the same rows. I said, okay, after two years of this, it's really boring. All the same rows. So I pulled them out, put in different roses. That first replant was okay. It wasn't great, but it was okay because they'd only been in there a few years. And then I grew those for about four or five years, and I got bored with those, started pulling them out, planting new roses right in the place. The new roses wouldn't bloom, but, you know, they'll have one bloom that year, and that was it. And that was it. They just sit there the rest of the year uh, with the leaves on them not growing at all. And I looked at the research. The American Rose Society had talked about rose replant syndrome, and I thought it wasn't the real thing until I experienced it in my yard. Uh, um, and at that time, I didn't know what how to cure it, so I pulled, started pulling the rose out, plant hibiscus there, which weren't effective. But what you do is you just put in uh, one of our employees who had a 100 rose rose garden would replace rose every year. He said one bag of either our astromix or our top out, the one cubic foot size, which is this size, placed in the hole around this rose would give it enough clean dirt to grow the rose he wanted. So that's what he would do, he would take a home a bag of our soil and put it in. Don't mix it, just put it in straight so there's no dead rose roots near the, the new plant. And then you're fine with that. If you pull out anything else that's not related to rose, there's no issues. It's just anything related to a rose is gonna mess it up. And again, uh, now in those days, we didn't know any better. We amended the soil with a lot of compost. Uh, I remember my rose bed, I wanted to do a real good job, so I made it one-third compost. The roses looked fine, but when I pulled some of them out in the following years, I noticed that the rose roots looked good for about four inches. Below that, they're all black and rotten. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I planted them too deep. I didn't really know much about soil back in the 80s. And then we figured out in the 90s that they don't like compost in the root system. Uh, it robs the roots of oxygen, so the roots that were too, too deep in that just suffocated and rotted out. Now, roses, fortunately, are so resilient, they grew a whole bunch of roots near the, near the surface, and they looked fine. They, they weren't really hurt severely by that. I'm sure they would have done better if I had you know, put them in sandy soil, which I did at my second house I lived at. 
and then they grew too tall. <laughs> so, so that's your the difference. And so, I mean, we had a customer once who was stationed in Saudi Arabia. He said for for five years he was a consultant, oil consultant over there. And he had a trailer parked in the sand and he wanted to get roses. They everybody laughed and said, You can't grow roses in the sand. He said his roses were taller than his trailer. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, so he was impressed by what sand can do for plants. So you get real vigorous plants, you know, you have to water more frequently, and you might have to fertilize more frequently in sand. But uh, they do real well. That's why the forest roses are grown that way. Okay, so in general, you can just take these roses, make a hole in the ground, and drop them in. Unless you've got, to, unless you're pulling out a rose, and you got to put something in. Uh, if you make your soil more soft and airy by adding sand or or acid mix, which has a lot of pumice rock in it, it will grow taller, faster. Uh, if you want that, so those are the main two things about insulation. Now, roses also like the ground covered with something so you can put bark on there uh you can grow ground cover on there some smaller plants like the uh hardy geraniums are a nice low growing bush that blooms around their base but they need the soil covered if you don't cover your soil uh, um in the summertime it just heats up too much if you see a rose garden up bare soil in the summertime all the rose plants look cooked the ground gets too hot the roses underneath that soil are cooking. Uh, the whole plant looks really ugly. It doesn't kill them, but they just don't look that. They don't look like spring anymore. They look like they've been beaten down by the heat. And that's mainly due to the soil temperature. So if you can cover the ground, you know, three inches of compost, bark, or just plant something there to keep the soil covered and cool, that really help a lot. Low bushes, uh, that really helps. Now they like water. Roses. A lot of the rose growers say, well, I'll, I'll water my full grown roses, which are, you know, like this, this four gallons a day. But we found during the last drought that they're a moderate water user. If you cut that water back 20%, they make it. They may not think and perform like they did, but we were amazed that, you know, some of our local parks, what plants were dying, what plants are surviving. The roses survived the drought fairly well. <laughs> We're losing flax plants and daylilies, and we're, we're just amazed that the plants we thought would handle the drought better were dying. Because I always thought roses were real high water plants. I mean, they like water, but they were surviving the drought pretty well. So, yeah, they don't go in with summer dormancy. They'll put flowering, they'll put growing, and they just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want them to stop growing so they don't use so much water, you just don't cut off the dead flowers. If you leave the dead flowers there, they shut down their new growth, they make the seed pods, and then that that the new growth uses up the most water. The older growth doesn't. So. I heard that um some people can alpha alpha like alpha meal. Alpha alpha meal? Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good for what? The micro museum. Mm -hmm. And if you're planting in the ground, all the uh, organisms it's that fine. you need are already there. You don't have to really add anything. But yeah, in the long run, organics are best. Uh, I found that out in the 80s. I was using grow power, which is a chemical-based fertilizer. And within a couple of years, a lot of my rows start showing iron deficiency. And when I when we switched to organic fertilizers, nothing. No, no deficiency showed up at all. So uh, it's better to stay organic in the long haul. Um, generally, the fertilizer frequency depends on what you're using. I mean, at the nursery, this for because we're too busy to fertilize every month with most fertilizers, you know, in containers, the fertilizer runs through more quickly. So if you use an organic fertilizer in a pot, you got to do it every month. If you're using the ground and every three months is usually okay. Uh, instead of doing that and us spending all our time fertilizing plants, we do use this chemical time release, which lasts six months. Usually, the we'll sell the roses before that time is over, so we do this one. 
Um, if you use this year after year, so you're eventually going to run into some nutrition problems, although this is quite well um, fortified. This has got 11 minerals. I don't know of any other chemical fertilizer that has 11 minerals, and that's one of the reasons why Osmond Coat is the most widely used fertilizer among uh, wholesale growers in the United States. So it does work quite well for a chemical fertilizer. Again, in the long run, organics are the best. They keep the soil nicer. We have artificial soil in our pots, so it's not a big deal for the time we have them. Um, a lot of the water soluble fertilizers, like this famous one from Southern California, have to be applied every few weeks. So, chemical fertilizers, especially the water soluble ones, not the time release, you have to do them quite often. Uh, most of the organics, not so often. In my own yard, I would fertilize with chicken manure once a year and do fine. So um, there's a lot of options. Chicken manure, the one thing about chicken manure is you don't know what's in it. They don't tell you. Of course, we know it's chicken manure, but they don't have any analysis on the bags. But I would put that over my rose bed, maybe one bag. It's a, it's a one cubic foot bag for every... Um, three or four roses. I didn't count, but I would just spread it out, cover it up with some bark. And for a year, they would just keep growing. So it's pretty Do amazing. you use that. your chicken manure on the bed? Is it dirt to use some of the other fertilizers to addition? No. Is there a benefit to it? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It, with fertilizers, it's always nice to change them around now and then because, you know, if you stay with one, if that one didn't have a nice balance of minerals that the plant needed, then the other one hopefully will pick it up. So there's a lot of options you have. And it's nice to do different things now and then just to just keep your bases covered. I mean, it's you won't know what your plant needs until it's deficient. <laughs> it's, uh, and even when it's deficient, sometimes you can't tell by the foliage. I mean, the guys at Soil Plant Lab in Anaheim told me, you know, you can guess. But sometimes they don't get it right. So he, they told me, I always recommend organics because with the organics, generally you're in the ballpark. So no matter what organic you use, like this is a combination of uh, fish bones, soybean, bean meal, a feather meal, kelp meal, you know, a lot of different types of organic matter you'll stay in the ballpark is most organic, you know, most things that were alive have the same minerals and plants and animals uh, are made out of pretty much the same minerals. So if it's a dead animal or dead plant, it's it's got pretty much everything in it. So we do have, you know, quite a few besides chicken manure, we have the doctor, which says rose on it, or the down root tree and shrub. The problem we're having with fertilizers right now is the price of this went sky high on us. Uh, just so you know, they're starting to come down. I think the panic is kind of over. So they're starting to decrease on us. And we'll, if I pay attention to it, I'll, I'll slowly drop the prices again on some of these things. But I mean, that's one thing that the pandemic and Ukraine did to the nursery industry is get the prices of the fertilizers in this, I would say, double in two years. It's, it's pretty sad. The chicken manure hasn't doubled. That's, that's why it was one thing that we use a lot of. Well, with the bird flu, that may change things, right? True. Well, you know, the uh, in the Central Valley, they, they said the cow farmers, their farmers are real happy because now their manure is worth something. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, Gary, mm -hmm. on your organics, if you have them in a closet in your garage, how long? Okay. So organic I fertilizers, we do recommend you use them fairly quickly because there's something dead in there. And if there's something dead in there, something live wants to eat it. So if there's, you know, if the package is open at all, you're going to get bugs living in it after a while, no matter where it is. Just like any food items, unless you keep in the fridge or uh, you know, totally locked up containers, even if they're not, a, even if they're in a locked container, sometimes in the packaging we get, 
we get, especially if it's a bag with tiny holes in it, we get bugs in there after about three or four months. So it's better to use them immediately so that the bugs are outside and not in your closet or in your- But kind of what I was thinking before was how long are they good for fertilizing? You know, do they lose their potency? Not really. Not really, oh, there yeah. isn't a- No. Okay. Um, yeah, um, even if something eats it, if as long as they stay in the bag, they're still the nutrients are still in them. Okay. Just like you buy bat guano, they said if you buy bat guano, you're not buying bat guano at all. Bats poop in the cave, poop drops to the ground. There's millions of bugs, and they keep eating the poop, and they poop too. So the poop you get in bat guano is generally insect guano. That's that's you know uh, processed bat bottle. <laughs> so, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything breaks down pretty fast if you set it out in nature and it's moist. It's moist. Okay. Um, as far as pest goes, now this year. I mean, the rain really helped. The roses look really good this year. And the one saving grace about the rains this year was that they were cold rain. So back east, they deal with warm rain because they get more rain during the spring and summer and fall than we do here. And warm rain causes a lot of diseases. Uh, cold rain, not so much. It's, you know, if it's 40 degrees, the disease don't like that. They like to be above 40 degrees. So. Um, generally with disease wise, well, okay, so I'll mention the one disease they're always scared of around here is a new disease that came out about 20 years ago called uh, downy. Oh, you know, I should mention, okay, besides these two rose classifications, which are the main ones, there are some roses called shrub roses, which don't fit the classification, so this is a Shrub rose, it looks a little wilder than these. You know, it doesn't look like it's as related to those. Uh, still valuable, in fact, most of the, a lot of the landscape roses that you see planted along the streets are shrub roses because most shrub roses are resistant to a lot of the common diseases found on the fancier roses, put it that way. So. What about the climbers? Climbers are just, Hybrides and floribundans that grow really long. So the climbers, which this is one here, act like the other roses, but they grow much longer stems. So they're not, they can't be used as bushes. Now, you know, most of the wild roses around the world grow like climbers, they're rambling. They grow long stems that grow one year and bloom the next. That's a typical way of growing for a lot of uh, a lot of the wild roses. One year you get this nice long stem, the next year it blooms and branches along that stem. Uh, and climbers just are have that wild rose bigger where they just grow seven, eight, ten foot long. Some of them do 20 foot long, two of them do that long. So it's the length of the stem that forces you to use them as a climber rather than as a shrub. So. <laughs> There are some climbers uh, in other rose categories too. So we have one out there called Cecile Booner, which has got leaves not unlike the ones on this shrub rose here. So it's another shrub rose. But this is one they use along highways a lot called the Ruby Maybe Lamp. Small leaves, smaller flowers. So so those are the shrubs and they come in all heights uh, and then there's the minis we don't carry too many miniature roses generally they are grown in mainly meant for container use because if you grow them in the ground then you got to get way down like this to see them um, so this is the miniature rose here. And generally their flowers are considered two inches or smaller. 
you can see that one's a fairly small flower there, a real dark purple. So that's a typical miniature. We don't, you know, we don't buy as many of those. Uh, you can actually get smaller miniature rose plants at a lot of grocery stores. <clears throat> Our suppliers, when they grow miniatures, they grow them in the ground and they thrive really big. So. What about um, David Austin? Are they, uh, you treat them differently yeah. than? Okay, so the other one, English roses, which are often called the old garden roses. Um, the flowers are more shaped like um, like these roses here. So the classic roses that we grow. that we have grown for most of the last 20, 30, 40 years or longer. This is called a uh, spiral, a single centered bloom. So there's essentially the, the petals wrapped around one center. Whereas the old garden rose, the English rose, they sometimes have multiple centers or more of a mismatch or peony-like flower rather than a single spiral like this tight spiral. So this is what people in the U.S. were told that they liked for 40 years until David Austin started sending over his English-style rose back in the uh, 80s. We started 80s, 90s. We started getting the David Austin rose from England. Now the problem with the old garden roses, where most of them were just once bloom a year. So David Austin said, uh, "I want to make old fashioned roses that bloom more than that." His first ones he sent over were just single bloom roses, uh, but they looked, you know, they looked more modern. But they still only bloom primarily once a year. And over time, he's his company developed roses. He did most of it, where you have multiple blooms on an old garden rose. Uh, now, in the meantime, in the U.S., a lot of the roses they developed had the shape to it. They just tossed them out. Then they said, okay, Dave and Austin sell these. We can too. So most of the roses now, a lot of the roses now look like English roses because they're accepted more. And they're made by all the other breeders too because they show up in their breeding work without the single sensors. And they have a place now where they can sell them also. So uh, the David Austin roses are interesting that well we'll talk about that when we talk about some maintenance things here so you have the miniatures the english um the climbers then you have the trees so on these tree roses all they do is the trunk on this tree is a different rose this is a Dr. Huey climbing rose. It's famous because it doesn't have any thorns uh, and it grows real thick and straight so they can make a nice trunk out of it. So the growers grow this plant first and then they graft four branches, four buds of another rose on here. And on this case, they did two white and two pink. So it's a mixed top. Most of them, it's a single color they put on it. But in this case, they put in uh, two different colors. This is uh, the brilliant pink iceberg and the original iceberg, which is white. They charge a little more for the mixed ones, even though it takes the same amount of work. Of course, they have to keep track of which colors they're putting on it. So that probably makes it worth the uh, effort. So they're really a bush on top of a, a long stem. And generally, because it's not a real trunk, you've got to keep a stake pretty much all its life. Well, roses are typically kind of leggy. So usually in a rose garden, you know, the roses, the typical rose shape is pretty much like this. So most rows, you want to put small shrubs around behind that. These can fit over taller shrubs. So a lot of, a lot of rose gardens still have 
short rows and around them can't be too tall rows and then these in the middle uh but i've seen other gardens where they have you know this boxwood or hedges and then they have these in the hedge sticking out Yeah. The one thing, so they're tree row. We only get one size. We can order shorter tree roses. So this tree rose is kind of tall for a pot because you have to do this to see the flowers. Uh, in the ground, it's the right height, uh, three foot of trunk. So the trunk will be this height with the flowers right about here. They make shorter stems, two foot, and they make 18 inch ones too. So when you put them in pots, you can still see the flowers without you know, being on the second floor or on the stairs. But these are the correct height for this uh, true rose in the ground. And you know, along a walkway going to your front door, it, it does look quite impressive. Because true rose, especially if they're all the same color, uh, are much more uniform looking than shrubs can be. So. Okay. Um, the disease lies in the wintertime, we really worry about one called downy. Now, most homeowners will never see downy. It can be called downy mildew. Here we don't even see the mildew at all. So on the East Coast, when they get downy mildew, they'll get great buzz covering the leaves and all the leaves turn yellow and fall off. Here, because their air is drier than it is on the East Coast, the leaves just turn model yellow and fall off. It, it, generally, you don't see it much here also because of the time here we're wet, uh, where it's colder. Uh, and the rows don't have that much foliage at that time because most people cut them back in the winter. But if you have a real dense foliage and it's raining and it doesn't dry out well, uh, Downey loves that. It just starts attacking, turning yellow, and then that'll drop off. Of course, when we hit 80 degrees, Downey's killed off. So uh, it doesn't take much, you know, so we don't worry about Downey too much here. If you're in Maine, Connecticut, boy, Downey can get you all the way into summer. We've heard one person say they cured it by connecting their water hose to their hot water uh, thing in their for their um, washing machine. And they sprayed them with 120 degree water and it cured them. Just by raising the temperature of the rose, the cure it stopped the downy mildew. So here we don't normally see it in the nursery. We're always have to keep our eye out because our rows are packed can to can so they're real crowded in there and if the leaves don't dry out after the rains we can start getting yellow leaves and so we're we're spraying every two weeks for that during the rainy season um, yeah it when you get down on a rose uh it goes into the stem and you can see it because instead of the stem being green or clean green, it's got this blotchy uh, purplish reddish blotches on it. Now, black spot also does that black spot disease, which we rarely get here, although we can get it uh, also is in the stems. So they say if you see those blotches, you cut that out, uh, get rid of it that way. Uh, generally with roses, um, <clears throat> we don't worry about disease on the ground at all. Uh, they did testing 20 years ago in Texas where they would um, sterilize the ground with lime sulfur, application of lime sulfur spray. We used to carry that. Now they deemed it too dangerous for homeowners, so we don't get to carry that anymore with that because it's an acid. But that would, they said, would sterilize the ground. So it, in theory, it would make your rose garden next spring more, you know, less get less diseases. They said it had no effect. So they stopped recommending sterilizing your garden in the winter because they said, apparently there's just too many disease spores floating in the air. You can't get away from them. It's pretty much worldwide. 
disease spores of roses floating in the air. So uh, yeah. no matter how much you do to your garden, you can't keep them out. I don't know. I haven't really checked that. When we see down, we get rid of it. Yeah, that's something I know that said she got, she's pretty sure she got down there on a plant that she just purchased. She just said it came from the girl. Oh, yeah. But yeah, they didn't invent it. It showed up here in the 80s, late 80s. And uh, so one of the big nurseries near us. They showed us what they were doing um, on their pruners. They had a little bottle of bleach that would spray their pruner every time they made a cut. Because they didn't know what, no one knew, you know, it was, uh, it was like a pandemic. They didn't know who, how it was spreading, what was going on. So they weren't taking any chances. They had this little bottle of bleach, bleach on their pruners. If you get downy, um, one of the safest products to use is a product called Garden Floss. There are about three products sold. We use Garden Floss because it's not really a fungicide. It's more or less a fertilizer that really stops downy pretty well. Uh, there's something about aluminum and there's some other products on the market that are out there too. But this one is the one we, we've used it twice, three times this year so far just to keep the downy from occurring. Usually it's commonly seen in homes on miniature roses because the foliage is so tight that it doesn't dry out well um, near the ground there and they turn yellow and fall. I mean, if you don't treat again, uh, come late spring, downy just stops. Doesn't like the warm weather. So that one we don't worry as much about. Black spot. Now, if it keeps raining on us, we'll see black spot. So black spot came to California and then not around the same time, well, just before Downey did. So late 80s, uh, California had never had black spot up until the late 80s. Then some of the things get transferred across the country. So when you have black spot on your leaves, you get this fuzzy black spot that covers about a quarter to half the leaf. It's a real fuzzy, nondescript edges. Uh, on your leaf. So kind of a fuzzy black spot. And then the whole leaf turns yellow and it falls off and it can get into the stems. You've got to kind of cut that back. That's the most serious disease east of the Rockies. It's black spot. Black spot apparently was not in the original rose that we sold. It's just in the 1800s. Well, in the 1800s, there were no yellow roses. And in order to get the yellow gene into the plant, they bred the roses with something called Austrian copper, which is kind of an orangey yellow. And they said that rose was susceptible to black spot. And unfortunately, they, because people were interbreeding all the roses with the yellow genes in them, then all the roses started getting black spot. So uh, a number of years ago, um, a lot of the breeders started from scratch. They went back to the original rose without any yellow genes and started breeding those to get rid of the black spot. Wow. And now they're finding some yellow roses even that don't get black spot because they have the right genetics in them. Wow. The famous one that came out was Knockout. So Knockout was the first one that they said was totally immune to black spot. Unfortunately, Knockout, we don't sell it because it's, it's not immune to mildew. So uh, we don't care here. Mildew is not as big a problem in the center of the United States. Black spots more of a problem where it's humid and hot. <clears throat> so we'll get, we can get this. Um, now, if you really want, don't want any disease on your roses, these are the main two that we use, Fungimax and Garden Floss. Well, Garden Floss only when it's raining. But the Fungimax, I believe the old name for this was the Eagle, and the real famous one 
in the 1990s and 2000s for taking care of just about any rose disease you can get. But it is a chemical thing. I don't use this at all in my house on my roses. Uh, but here at the nursery, uh, we use it about every two, three weeks or so just to make sure that they don't get any diseases. There's a different, so this, this chemical here is called microbutanol. And then, and this Bayer product, they have a, a different uh, fungicide called sevaconazole. So we'll use this once in a while too. You don't want to use the same disease control forever. Uh, your diseases can get immune fairly quickly to a single item. Now, the worst problem we get actually is powdery mildew. So dry, humid, cool at night, like Orange County, um, promotes mildew. Mildew does not like rain. With all this rain been having and the cool temperatures, mildew likes it between 55 and uh, 85 degrees. Again, much above 85, mildew's burned away. Below 55, it doesn't like it. Doesn't like rain. Uh, rain keeps washing it off. Uh, here's a little bit of mildew on one stem of this rose. Oh, on the back side, you can see a little bit of this white, white cast on it. And uh, I know Iceberg's always been famous for getting it on the stems of the flowers. So mildew is generally a problem April through June. Once we get to July, it warms up too much. It's not a problem. Um, it's a surface disease. It's not internal. Now, generally, you can cure mildew fairly easily within one week of when you see it. If you wait a couple weeks, it's, it gets stuck in the foliage or uh, too much, and it's better just to clip it off. I mean, I had a rose once that was totally covered in mildew. I wanted to see what the rose would do. If it was just totally covered in mildew, it was full of buds right open. Those buds never opened. It just stayed there covered with mildew for months and months and months. I said, well, this is a waste of time. So I just cut it all off and the plant regrew and, and bloomed very quickly. But uh, the mildew just stunts the growth on everything. So, so. so mildew control you can use these products, but back in the 80s, before we had downy, before we had black spot, all we did for powder mildew was hit them with an uh, organic oil, all seasons oil. And baking soda. Okay, so there's another organic oil called neem. Um, this burns roses fairly easily, and it, uh, it's got a nice strong smell too. It does control mildew a little better than this oil, but uh, neem has some weird qualities to it. It's, it's solid at about 55 degrees, so it, or it turns into jello. So the first time we used it, it was February. And we stored our sprayer in our little cupboard outside and we poured this in there and it just solidified on the side of the sprayer. We're going, oh, <laughs> it won't come out. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, if we use neem, we had to put hot water in the sprayer first. <clears throat> you know, if it's in the summertime, no big deal, but we don't get mildew in the summer. We get in the spring when it's cool and you have to put hot water in here. Don't have to do that for this. So we don't really use this much. Plus when this first came out, you know, that sulfur odor, the whole nursery smelled like a volcano. <laughs> you know, just sulfur, because there's sulfur and neem, which helps to control mildew, but that sulfur is nasty. They put a fragrance in here on a mask it, but it's still there. You can still kind of detect it, but they put something that smells better than neem. So, so this has no smell, uh, no color. It's clear. Um, I believe we used it at two, 
two ounces per gallon, or it might have been three ounces per gallon. One tablespoon of baking soda per gallon. What's the maximum temperature at which you would use that? 90 degrees. And you can use it pretty high. So in the old days, they always warned you about using oil during warm weather because the oil was too contaminated with sulfur. Sulfur and oil is a bad combination. That's why I name will burn easy because it's got a lot of sulfur in it. Uh, in the modern oil starting around 1990, they started taking a whole bunch, most of the sulfur out of the oil that was in there naturally in petroleum uh, so that it would stop burning. So here it says all seasons oil because you can spray in the middle of summer. Uh, I would say if the sun's not out, 95 degrees, not a problem. If the sun's out, I'll wait till it gets below 90, but if it's set in setting, 95, it doesn't burn. So we use this with one tablespoon of baking soda on a rose in our pressure sprayer. Or we have a backpack sprayer that it sprays real hard. Um, I think it's uh, about a 75 PSI. And our roses, you know, you looked at the roses in the next week, they were real glossy because of the oil. The oil also kills most of the bugs and it killed the mildew. The baking soda is in there because oil doesn't have that much um, residual. The baking soda kept the mildew spores or most of these spores from sprouting for three or four days beyond when you sprayed it. So that combination, we did that for years and years. You know, totally organic, no bugs, no disease until all those new things came in. <laughs> but for your home, this still may be just fine. Uh, you're not going to see as many exotic diseases as we do here with, you know, 400 roses in one spot. You're going to get more diseases uh, that way. But uh, so this is still quite valuable for us. Um, these are pretty much your diseases. At my own house, I only have a few roses at the current house I'm at. I never treat them for disease. They're they're about eight foot apart. They don't seem to pick up anything. So rust. Okay, yeah. Thank you. We got about that. One. The rust is a water related, rain related disease. If the water sits on the leaf for four hours or more, same with black spot. If it's if after the rain stops or after you finish irrigating, if the water sits on that leaf for four hours without moving the disease spores have a chance to enter the leaf and cause a disease. So rust, uh, um, I don't know, need rust in our nursery this year, which is nice. But the leaves will get spotty yellow. And then at a certain point when the rust disease matures, you'll see orange spores on the bottom of the leaf that look like rust on a metal. And uh, the orange spores are the spores that'll fly around and infect other roses. Uh, so rust, the same fungicides, I don't think oil controls rust that well, but the same fungicides work on rust too. So those are your main disease. Now there's one other one that shows up now and then that's pretty bad. We think it's a um, king blight. We're not sure, no one can seems to be able to analyze it. So about three years ago, uh, we had rows in a nursery, this one area where we were pruning the old flowers off in late spring, and suddenly all their stems started turning black. Uh, so we said, okay, this is really weird. Cut off the entire stems to stop it. And uh, some of our customers started pouring. One customer said in their road, 50 rose rose garden, every single rose did the same thing, turned black, died. And uh, so they quit growing roses. And we heard that from a few customers. We heard that there is something called rose cane blight. We sent pieces that off our roses to the rose growers, uh, and they couldn't analyze it. So apparently it's a disease that hasn't been studied, so they can't recognize it or they don't know what it was. But it was all happening in one section of our nursery, so we believe it was a disease that we're spreading 
probably from our pruners if they're all having the same area but we don't know anything about it we knew that we had to get cut the stems off before the whole plant died uh, uh, so we don't know any further what to tell you but there is something on the internet called rose king blight but no one has a lot of information about it so yeah it's an issue with thrips and um Oh yeah, uh, that's next. That's bugs. We'll come up with that next. So diseases. Now, one of the ways we started um, dealing with diseases more efficiently in our garden. So the traditional way of trimming roses in Southern California had always been middle winter or early winter, December, January, and you know, uh, thirty years ago we used to have winters that would make the rose look so bad in the winter that it was natural to do at that time. And then in the late 80s, someone from back east wrote to the LA Times saying, why do you guys pitch your roses back in the middle of winter? We always wait till the winter's over. They want to see what the winter did to the roses before they would cut them. And I thought to myself, well, this kind of makes sense because if I prune them in December, the new leaves start growing in January and it's still raining, it's still raining. They get all black spot and rust and everything. And I got to take all the leaves off again and treat them in April. So I said, okay, why don't I just wait till the rain's over? Of course, this year we don't know when that's going to be, but generally it's over in March. Uh, or at least you don't get much rain after March, let's put it that way. So you'll get rain. So when the roses start their new growth, you've got about a month, month and a half where the rain doesn't affect the new growth. For some reason, new leaves on roses, I guess because there's so much air circulation around them, they don't catch any diseases until they start looking like, you know, like this. That's when they start picking up the diseases, primarily probably because of poor air circulation among the, the, the mature foliage. So if you put them, so I, used, I would start pruning my roses, you know, in April, early April, they'd be full of rust, full of black spot, just, Cut all those leaves off, get rid of them. I'd also, at the same time, clean up everything on the ground, uh, throw it in my backyard underneath my fruit trees. Uh, so I didn't throw it away, at least, but uh, cleaned it up, then put new layer of chicken manure on the ground, new layer of bark on the ground, trim my roses back, and they were clean. And, and generally, it wouldn't rain enough to infect than leaves after that. So I wouldn't have to worry about black spot or mill or uh, rust. So those are two things by pruning late, you know, just at the end of winter or the beginning of spring, you won't have to deal with them as much. If you prune too early in the winter, you gotta deal with the rust and the black spot. So mm -hmm. and you can prune rose back any time of the year. I, when I was younger and I had a lot of time on my hands before I was married, put it that way. I would prune my roses back in the middle of summer because the new growth is so much prettier than leaves that were six months old. So uh, I'd prune them back in the middle of summer to see what happened. Nothing happened. They were fine. Prune them in August. Nothing happened. They don't burn. They just grow real fine, real nicely. So you can prune them several times a year if you like. And that helps deal with a lot of these diseases. Okay, so generally on roses, this time you'll see aphids. So we've already seen aphids on these roses. Aphids are the little green pear shaped bugs that multiply real fast on the new growth of your rose. Um, we used to spray a lot for that in the old days with the product called orthene. But if we sprayed with orthene, we always ended up with spider mites. So we quit using that product altogether and stopped getting spider mites. Uh, now my own house, I just leave the aphids alone. Generally, by the time the flowers open, the growth is too hardened off. They can't live there anymore and they're gone. And also at that time, the natural predators have come out and they'll keep your roses clean the rest of the year. So that first bloom, the aphids excrete the sticky stuff. You might have some sticky buds and leaves around them, but if you don't treat them, generally they're gone after that first bloom and the ladybugs now arrive, the lacewing larva, the surfeit fly larva, 
Uh, the serpent flies were the weird ones. Um, I'm going to spell serpent fly serpent. I think it's serpent. Nope. <laughs> well, anyway, they're they're also known as bee flies or drone flies. There's, they're little flies that are colored like bees, but you can tell they're fly because they have the big eyes and only two pairs of wings and they hover. They also call them hover flies. So you'll see them around a rose with aphids on them and they're doing this. They're sitting up here looking and then they suddenly dive down and come back. They dive down and come back. They're laying eggs. And they're little green maggots that hatch out of those eggs eat aphids better than anything else we've ever seen. They're more effective than than uh, than ladybugs, but they look terrible on your rose. This green maggot traveling around the stems. I thought it was a pest when I first saw it, and then I looked it up and I go, okay, that guy eats can eat 20, 30 aphids a day. Now the reason why aphids are so bad, you know, they're kind of shaped like this. These the antenna, they got little things on the rear end. They're born, they're born pregnant. In fact, they're born with five generations in them. So they multiply in two days. So the adult aphid flies and lands on and starts giving live birth to these aphids that already have embryos in them. He said there's five generations. Whenever one is born, there's already five generations within its body. So within two days, it can give birth to another generation. Within two days out, it just keeps going. So from one aphid, you can have what? How many is that? 20 in one week? Yeah. So aphids, you know, you blast them off of water. If you miss one, the next week it looks the same. <laughs> now, aphids are hard to kill with organic materials. Although we think that the Dr. Earth products that have um, Essential oils and several essential oils do a better job than single oils like these or these. These are just a single type of oil. This one has rosemary, clove, peppermint, garlic. There's there's combinations of oils, and those seem to kill them. On the organic side, they seem to kill aphids a little better than the single oils. Um, we use the stronger stuff here because we don't think people want to see any aphids at all. Uh, but again, the ladybugs will come in, the serpent flies. There's also these little midges. They all take care of uh, the aphids for you. If you don't spray orphane on them, we don't sell orphane anymore. So aphids, the first bug out, usually this time of year. Then we get the um, western flower throats. Thrips generally have become the, the one bug that's the most bothersome in the nursery industry and farming too now. Uh, they're little tiny sliver-shaped bugs that fly around, the adults fly around. So what happens this time of year is just as soon as the bud shows color, it'll affect the rest of the, the flower. But as soon as the bud shows color, like this bud here, just now opening up to show the color. The flower thrip sees that the western flower thrip lays, you know, 50 eggs on there. So the younger thrips, which look like the adult without wings, and they're usually amber colored, the adult's black, um, go inside the flower and start um, sucking on the outer petals. So in the spring, you'll see a lot of your, they like light colors better. White, yellow, cream, light pink. They make all the edges of the petals turn brown. The inside petals look fine. They haven't gone that far into the flower, but the outside petals are messing them up. So that's what the Western Flower Thrip does. Um, there's another thrip that comes later here that does a lot more damage than that. But the Western flower group make all your flower petals. Now, for some reasons, in my yard rose garden, they didn't like red at all. They never affected the red rose, the dark colored roses. They don't like them. They seem to like the lighter color. The lighter the color, the more they you see affected. So the way you treat that, you take this 
spin on sad soap, which is organic. I mean, there are chemical ways to do it too, but this one is actually one of the most effective. So spinosad. Now we have four different spinosad products on the shelf. Only two of them have soap in them to make them stick to the buds better. The other one's just, I don't know, the rose buds are very waxy. So the other ones aren't as effective. So the spinosad soap, I have another one called Natria in a green bottle. And you spritz the buds as, just as they show color. So you go out there twice a week. Every bud is just starting to crack open. Like this bud here. Just starting to crack open, you spritz it, and that'll protect it for until it's open. So every air twice a week, you go out there, and every bud you see, you spritz it, and within a couple of weeks, you've stopped it. You totally stop it. It's nice if you if it's been going on for a while, collect all the roses with the brown edges and throw them in the trash because the baby thrips in there will um, migrate to the newer roses. So as they turn, they turn into adults and, and they go to the new rows. So you got to get rid of the old flowers with thrips in them. Uh, but you spritz them for a couple of weeks, twice a week, and you you cleared it up. Gary, unless unless your neighbor doesn't brown? treat theirs. I'm I'm missing what turns brown. The edge of the petal. Of the unopened. Yeah. Well, so you'll see all the. Outer petals on your rose have brown edges. Okay. I mean, you can, you know, to make the rose look fine, you can just pick off the outer petals, but <laughs> but it's nice not to have that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when it gets hot, Another thrip shows up that's really bad. So there's a thrip called the chili thrip. It's all up in this. Um, this thrip came from India, it showed up in Orange County about six years ago. The Orange County Rose Society calling up and it's gotten here. Totally messes up the rose. So the chili thrip not only attacks the flower buds, it'll attack the entire new growth coming off the edge. So if you have new growth that's in this stage here, those chili thrips not only go up to the buds, even the unopened buds, they'll suck on everything. So a chili thrip, yeah. So the, the buds, the leaves, everything just shrivels up. So here's... A uh, somewhat damaged stem from last year at my house. That <laughs> this particular leaf from last year got messed up by the chili thrips. It only grew that big instead of mature size. It only grew that big. Here's another one. All these leaves were messed up by the chili thrips last summer, late last summer. And I lost maybe two rounds of flowers because so, I didn't treat it at my house. I uh, just want to see how long it lasts. So, so fortunately, you know, California, most years we don't warm up until August. Last year we warmed up in July. So we started seeing the chili thrip damage uh, in July. And then by August, people come and tell us the roses just died or they stopped blooming. What's wrong? So all they, you know, they you can't see the chili thrips. They're so small, especially the babies on your plant, that if you're looking at it, you just can't see them, but if you take a, a branch and you slap it on a piece of white paper, then suddenly you'll see little black slivers, you know, one branch, 50, 60 of them, just running around on this piece of white paper. Mm -hmm. If they had left it alone, the plant would have lived. Yeah. Cutting it off and new growth kept coming and getting infected. Finally, the plant used up all the time. Yeah, leave it alone. I left mine alone, and they, they're fine in the, you know, about midway through fall, they were doing their thing again. But uh, so the most, the best spray for chili thrips is also a spinosad. 
Now, the bad thing about any sprays is that bugs can, can become immune to them very quickly. Uh, and Spinal said they said only kills about 94% of all the thrips that are on the plant. So the 4% that are alive, it won't kill anymore. So they do say to alternate it with something, a different product. And they often say to use neem oil or one of the other oils on the other week. So Spinal said last two weeks. The next week, you would hit them with an oil spray. Oil sprays aren't super effective against thrips, but they'll kill some, and hopefully it's the 4% that the spinosad didn't kill. So that's the great hope. Now, the nursery will often use other products that you can't get. So there are the other products that uh, will kill thrips quite well that are not available to the public. So. But for you, those two, again, spinosad is the most effective and then hit them with something else uh, and all an alternate week. My experience is they just, they just go after the new fresh growth. So if you've got a big growth, you can't treat it. You can just let it make the hits and let it sit there. Don't cut back on the water and just let it just sit there until the fruit season is over. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't do a thing. I slept alone and then it started growing again when it got cooler. So. This this last year was warmer than usual, although we had a similar hot year, what, 2018? It was another real hot year, hot summer. Last summer, or two summers ago, we didn't see them much at all. It didn't heat up until the end of August, and by that time, it was kind of late for them. To, I mean, if you're in Florida or Texas, you're dealing with them May through October. It's pretty nasty down there. So we're lucky here in that we don't get extremely hot, extremely quick keep those chili strips out. I should mention one of the other problem on disease wise. So you notice this flower here got brown. So when it's raining, the water collects in the flower bud and it causes this rotting of the petals. So what I've been doing all this last week is going around the roses and doing this to them shake the water out. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of work, but if you don't want that rosebud to rot, shake the water out. Now, if you shake too hard, you'll break it off. But there's, there's the technique. I mean, you know, you just, and then you'll see the water just shoot out of there and then it's, then it doesn't do this. But uh, that's, I think this is botrytis just from being, having water sitting in the bud for a while. Okay, now we do get now and then caterpillars eating the rose buds in summer and green grasshoppers and red grasshoppers doing the same. The green grasshoppers and caterpillars, uh, the spinal set will also control that. The brown grasshoppers, nothing kills the host, so you gotta get them by hand. Now, there's another uh, bug that you'll see, especially near the coast, called a rose slug. And these just take the leaf and make holes, makes the leaf turn to lace. And when they're real bad, you just have veins left in your leaf sitting there. And they usually start at the bottom work they wear up the plant. The real slugs aren't real slugs, they're actually larvae of a wasp. Low slug wasp, which doesn't sting, a real common on the coast. The spinal sad will take care of that too. Um, now, some people like to use BT, which is a bacterial disease that kills caterpillars. Unfortunately, it won't go after row slugs because row slugs not a caterpillar. Even though it looks like a green caterpillar, it's actually not a caterpillar. So the BT won't control that. BT only controls caterpillars. The spinal saddle control, caterpillars, beetles, green grasshoppers, road slugs, and take care of most of the other bugs, plus the thrips. So, you know, on the road slugs, there can be five generations a year, so you might have to do it more than once. 
It is fairly expensive, and it uh, and it, you know if you use it when you don't need it, you might make some bugs immune to it. So it's better not it's better not to use things too often. Now, in in the nursery industry, when they when we go after pests, they always tell us to use one product twice before you switch. You want to make sure you kill everything you can with that one product before, and then you switch to a different product. Uh, so that uh, I know that. That's what they told it works. I don't know why you just wouldn't go from one to the next to one to the next, but they said hit it twice with these products to make sure you kill every single bug you can with that product before you switch to the next product. That's what they're that's what the universities tell us to do. So um oh now I used to see this a lot more I do now. So there's another bug called a raspberry. <clears throat> so when you cut off the old rows, this was back in the 80s, where I cut cut off the rows, some bug would drill down that stem about two or three inches and kill the stem off for two or three inches. Now it's not a big deal because the rows of this grow from the next loop, next healthy part below that. But it would drive me nuts because you have all these brown ends on your roses, and it's this little uh, um, beetle that would lay eggs right on the end of that cut stem. They would see the cut stem, lay eggs on it, and then drill down into there. So uh, you'd have to keep clipping it off, and if you clipped it off again, of course, they would drill down again. Hmm. So in those days, what they had a lot of remedies. One of the ones we used was just pruning tar is covered so they couldn't tell it was cut. Some people use Vaseline, some people use fingernail polish, some people put a piece of tape on it, something white glue, yeah. That's a, that's a good one because you don't see it. It's not as ugly as black tar. So if you see that, then you do that for a few weeks and they'll stop and leave you alone. But that was real common back in the 80s and it was talked about throughout the industry. But uh, I haven't really seen it much in the last uh, 10 years or so. Any questions? Yes. I've been growing roses since the 70s or 80s. And back then, you could get certain flowers. I'll, I'll give you a good example, like a hybrid fashion. Great growth. But then rose growers, as they come out with new versions and iceberg is, I guess, a derivative of that, they don't grow the old rose anymore, right? Is that true? Uh, well, they it's it's of course it's all economics. So one of the great roses from the eighties I like was White Masterpiece. I thought it was the best white hybrid tea out there, and then Jackson Kirkman stopped growing it. You know, why is that? I love this rose. You know, it's such a big rose that the first year stems could hold up the flower, they, they would just lay on the ground. And the second year they get strong to hold up that flower. So I had, I asked another rose grower, can you grow this for me? He said, sure, we can grow any rose. Yeah. They did it for one year and quit. They said, yeah, the, the reason why they stopped growing is because you only get about a 30% graft tape. In other words, they, they, in those days they would grow rose by, they actually would grow the Dr. Huey stem for a few months cut it off, insert the bud from that rose in it. And, you know, they usually, typically they would get 90, 95% tape. The buds would take and they, this draft would be successful. Uh, but on uh, White Masterpiece, apparently they're only getting 20 or 30% take. And it was just not worth their time to graft a whole row of that or something, or it didn't sell. You know, if it didn't sell, they quit selling it or quit growing it. That probably explains why today you, you can't get a holy magic or a spellbound, which were great roses back then. Well, see, one of the, the interesting things about rose growing and breeding in those days was that they grew it. So uh, Jackson Perkins actually had a breeding ground in the middle of Irvine. 
even though they're based on the East Coast originally, and then they moved to Oregon, their breeding ground was here in Orange County. So they're breeding roses that did well here. Apparently, color magic doesn't grow well anywhere else in the country. Yeah, yeah it's it's super sensitive to cold. And when they're breeding here, they didn't see that. So a lot of the roses from Jackson Perkins and a lot of the rose breeders are breeding in California, in fact, because our climate's so nice for rose growing here, is that they didn't know that they were failing throughout the country. So they, they started having test rose gardens at that time to test the rose throughout the country and make sure they would live there. But color magic, you know, that thing had flowers like that. Uh, but I would notice even in, in Lake Forest where I lived at that time, the stems were dying in the winter from cold. It was just, it was just a very delicate rose. So uh, not suitable for the rest of the country. So, uh, but yeah, uh, so a lot of those roses, yeah, the breeders weren't doing it right to begin with. Now they're, I don't know, uh, rose industry has contracted now for the last 25, 30 years or so. They're not breeding like the Eastern the main breeders now in England, Europe, where it is cooler. Uh, not so much in California anymore. Yes. I have rose, I can't do it. So I've been often with the stalker here. I'm trying to get this stuff. Got some stalks in the ground. Absolutely. But my gardener said the roots really have started. When I'm going to catch, if I can move it. And I just don't ever see much. But it's like it's a baby, it finally works. Well, if the leaves reach full size, you got roots. If mm -hmm. the leaves, yeah, if they're real little, you may not have any roots yet. Well, that's at the bottom of the cup. Second here is a pure little thing. But... Yeah, you won't know, and you won't know for a while. I mean, this leaving there. Yeah, well, wait until you see, if you see, start seeing big mature leaves, you got roots. But any cutting, unfortunately, can make small leaves with no roots. But if they have the roots, they have the the minerals to make the bigger leaves, then you know. What she means by that is if you have a a piece of a rose, and you have a callus forming at the bottom of the, you can't see this it's in the ground, uh, but if you had a glass of water, you'll see a big, like, tumor forming down here of, of um, kind of cream-colored tissue, and from that, usually the roots start growing from that. And so that callus forms first, then the roots start growing, and then your leaves take off and really get going, then you so, so a lot of roses now are not grafted. So in the old days, pretty much all roses were grafted because that was efficient for the rose growers to do. They stuck in pieces of, of Dr. Huey stem into the ground. Uh, and then the next, and then they could determine later that spring which roses they would graft onto it. Now, most rose growers are switching to only roses, roses grown by not by grafting, but by cuttings. Like you've done. Not all roses grow well from cuttings, but most of them can be. Not all of them do. Um, and it helps to have it have it be on its own roots, especially if you live in Michigan or Canada, because in Canada, the whole top of your rose might freeze. As long as the roots are still alive underground, the same rose will grow back if you if it's grafted onto Dr. Huey, like most of these are. It freeze to the ground, Dr. Huey roses start growing, which are climbing roses with red flowers that bloom once a year. So a lot of people tell me, you know, my iceberg is growing red flowers. And I said, well, that's suckers. You got suckers coming up from the roots now. I said, no, it looks just like the, the white iceberg. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if they get a if they get a red iceberg rose, you know, like this is a pink iceberg and there's a burgundy iceberg. If they get a red iceberg, they can make a million dollars. So I tell them, all oh, the way to tell if it's truly an iceberg that's turned red, you wait for the, re you cut those flowers off if it blooms again, you're in good, you're in good shape. Dr. Huey blooms once a year, so he never came back. Apparently it was just his Dr. Huey suckers coming out of the ground that were mixed with his white iceberg rose. So, 
I have a whole bunch of red roses and I never knew why because I never planted them. I planted something else. Okay. Yeah, so and roses, if something happens to the top, they often, the roots start growing and it's Dr. Huey down there. So they all turn red, you get this nice spring bloom and that's it for the year. It, they grow Dr. Hugh because it grows best. So most 90% of the roads in the United States are actually grown near Fresno uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's nice and hot and dry all summer, no diseases to worry about. And in the fall when they're in winter, when they're harvesting the roads out of the ground, covered in tule fog. So they can they pile the roads out of the ground one row at a time. They're laying there on the ground. And it's totally fogged over, so they don't have to worry about them drying up. Is that area of, of uh, Central California stays foggy? I mean, it's dangerous to live there in that time of year. You, can, you know, a lot of traffic accidents, but the fog makes it great for all the bare root wow. growers. All the bare root fruit tree growers are in that area because perfect conditions for growing bare root. Plus, the ground is really shallow. Like we used to get roses, bare rose from Howard's of Hemet. Near Hemet, they had this real sandy, rocky soil. So we got these bare roses in from them. They had one root that went straight down like a carrot. It's like two foot long rose roots that go straight down. It wasn't what we wanted, you know, because you, you cut that short, there's only one root. Um, when you grow them in the clay soils in the, in the southern part of the Central Valley, the rose roots are real numerous, small, near the surface where they can plow them out better. So that's another reason why all the rose growers are right there. Jackson Perkins used to be there. Weeks is still there. Star, which is the biggest rose company in the world nowadays, is right there also. So they all grow their roses there. Um, now, in its heyday, Jackson Perkins, it's interesting, grew 60 million, like six, six million rose. No, I think it was 16 million rows a year. And they had sent catalogs to every household in the United States. That's big business. Let me do that. That that's crazy. I mean, how many rose companies? You know, Jack Perkins fell apart in the early '90s when the rose industry started to shrink. They just went bankrupt several so over and over and over because they they kept trying to be the rose for every household, and and it just wasn't happening because the rose industry was actually shrinking. So it, it shrank. Constantly, slowly, up until two years ago, pandemic turned it around. So our rose grower said uh, to us back in 19, uh, 2015, they were cutting their inventory by 70,000 roses because they, you know, they had too many roses. No one was buying them, but now they have to go the other way again. So this year, and the reason we don't have, like last year, we had about. 600 rows at this point. Now this year we have 400 because we didn't get shipment on a lot of the rows we ordered. This, our rows, both our rows were said for the first time in their history, they didn't have enough rows to cover the orders because the industry is starting, you know, the, the demand is expanding quickly again and they can't catch up because they're always two years behind. It takes two years to grow these. So. Um, I have mine in the pot and last year I mulch with the bark mulch. So to get the shoes and stuff, that you have to throw away the pot, the mulch. It, you don't have to throw it away. I mean, it's nice. It might look cleaner though, but disease-wise, it, it, there's it, no it, problems. It, yeah, it's good. It looks good, but you know, in order to put fertilize, you I'll just put it right on top and water it through. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to mold, move the mulch to put the fertilizer down. Okay. And then can I review the yeah, 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 good reason. You can put more on there. I mean, in our rose garden, we would, I mean, because I had so many dead rose petals on the ground and dead rose leaves, I would just gather all that up because this is my front yard and throw it in my backyard and then put in a fresh new layer in the front yard, keep it looking nice, you know, keep the neighbors happy. Mm -hmm. So I do it that way, but. So I don't yeah. need to throw it away and they get clean up. Like all the dead leaves. Mm -hmm. We have a big problem with rust. We have a lot of rust. 
you know, according to the in, to the research in that matter, they said that rust is only active when it's on the leaf on the plant. Once it falls off the leaf, that rust is no longer active. Uh, well, I said it doesn't matter anyway because there's so many rust spores in the air. It doesn't matter if you clean up your garden or not. It's yeah. what they found. It doesn't really matter because it's just so pervasive. They used to. Right. They used to, but uh, the research in Texas proved it didn't matter. They said they sterilized the rose bed as good as they can. It didn't do anything. It didn't stop any disease. So this, this, you know, watch the weather, get the water off the leaves, all that stuff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.